plus 75 years or so. The kids in the shop were like kids everywhere. That weird, hyper-aware thing that came from the games they played all the time, even in their sleep. The flawless skin and teeth, because no parent would dare choose otherwise at conception. The loud, hooting calls that rippled through the little social groups whenever a particularly bon mot vibrated his way through their tight little networks, radiating at the speed of light. Chloe watched them keenly from her perch behind the counter. After 70-some years perching on a stool, she'd finally done away with it. The exoskeleton she'd been fitted for on her 90th birthday would lock very handily into a seated position that took all the pressure off her bum and knees and hips. It was all rather glorious. Kids came into the store every day now, and in ever-increasing numbers, she flicked her eyes sideways and menued over to her graph of young people in the shop over time, warming herself on the upward trend. It was Arthur's 110th birthday today, the mad old sod, and he was meant to be coming into the shop for one of his rare tours of inspection. That had the staff all a twitter. He was something of a legend, the man who started the distributorship that put small, carefully curated handfuls of books into the few retailers across the land who let young people in. No one could have predicted how well books and halal fried chicken went together. <laughs> how long have you known him then? Marcel, her store manager, was only a few years older than the kids who ghosted past her counter, playing some weird round of their game, listening to cues only they could hear heads all cocked identically. Let me put it this way. The first time we met, I was riding a brontosaurus. <laughs> he did her the favor of a smile, radiant and handsome as a movie marquee. They were all like that these days. Thankfully, she was old enough not to feel self-conscious about it. Now, seriously, Chloe, when did you meet him? I was 14, no, 15. That was before he was Sir Arthur Levitt, saviour of English literacy, you understand. And before you were Chloe Autumn, superstar author. He was kidding her. They stopped caring about what she wrote decades before he was born, but he knew about her history and liked to tease. He had an easy way about him when it showed in the staff. Before then, yes. I still don't quite understand what it was he did. What was so different about his bookshop? It wasn't a bookshop, she said. You didn't know that part? He shook his head. Well, that's the most important part. It wasn't a bookshop. Back then, bookshops were practically the only place you could get a book. I'm sure the news agents might carry a few titles, but they were the same titles all around the country. Bookshops are fine if you already love books. But how do you fall in love with books? Where does it start? There has to be books everywhere, in places where you go, before you know you're a reader. That was the secret. So, how do you do it? I'll tell you how, Arthur said. He padded up to the counter on the oiled, carefully balanced carapace of his exoskeleton, moving as spryly as a jaguar. His eyes glittered with mad, birdy glee. Hello, Chloe, he said. <laughs> Happy birthday, love, she said, uncurling herself and levering herself up on tiptoe, the gyros whining to give him a kiss on the cheek. Arthur, this is Marcel. They shook hands. I'll tell you how, Arthur said again, clearly enjoying the chance to unfurl one of his old, well-oiled stories. It was all about connecting kids up with their local neighbourhoods and the tastes there. Kids know what their friends want to read. We had them curate their own anthologies of the best, most suitable material from the story so far. Put all that local knowledge to work. The right book for the right person in the right place. You've got to give them a religious experience before you can lure them into coming to church regular. <laughs> Arthur thinks reading is a religion, Chloe said, noting Parcell's puzzled expression. Obsolete, you mean? 
Marcel <laughs> Arthur opened his mouth, shut it, prepared to have an argument. Chloe short-circuited it by reaching under the counter and producing a carefully wrapped package. Happy birthday, you old sod, she said, and handed it to Arthur. He was clearly delighted. Slowly, he picked at the wrapping paper, making something of a production of it, so much so that the kids started to drift over to watch. He peeled back a corner, revealing the spine of the book, the neat stitching, the nylon from an old, old backpack, the worn denim, the embroidered title on the spine. You didn't, he said. I certainly did, she said. Now finish unwrapping it so that we can have some cake. 150 years from now, ish. The young man blinked his eyes at the coruscating lights and struggled into a seated position, brushing off the powdery residue of his creation. The story so far, he said. The story so far, a voice agreed with him, from a very long way off and so close in it was practically up his nose. Better than great expectations again, he said getting to his feet, digging through the costumes on the racks around him. Knowledge slotted itself in his head, asserting itself. Plots, other characters, what had come before, the consensus about where things might go next. He didn't like the consensus. He began to dress himself. Tell me about the reader, he said. The voice was back in an instant, describing the child, for the circumstances of his birth and life, his interests. So I'm a picture book? No, the voice said. He's reading in chapters now. It's the cognitive fashion here. At here, more knowledge asserted itself. The shape of the comet on which they all resided, their hurtling trajectory, a seed pod of humanity on its way elsewhere. Right, he said, putting on gloves picking out a moustache and a sword and a laser blaster. Let's go sell some books. <laughs>